Good afternoon. This is the VPK uh, presentation regarding the readiness rate reports. Um, if I can get a couple people that are online to go ahead and click if they can or type yes into the question box if they can hear me and see our screen with the presentation page on it. Okay, getting lots of yeses. Thank you very much. We'll be starting the call in just about five minutes. Good afternoon. This is Gary Savage. I'm here with Cassandra Jackson from the Office of Early Learning. Today we're giving a, a relatively short presentation on how to read the uh, kindergarten readiness rate reports. So we know there's been a lot of confusion out there and we just thought we would do these in advance before the, all the reports come out to help providers understand how to read their reports. 
<clears throat> so if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so we're just going to do a quick overview. We've done this in many presentations of the changes that occurred in August of this of 2019 to Rule 6M-8.601 from the Administrative Code. Um, we're going to talk about, do a review of the readiness rate calculation process for the uh, 1819, I think that says 20, uh, readiness rates. And then we're going to go through several examples of uh, the reports, just so folks, when they're reading their reports, when they do come out, that they know what the different pieces on their report means. <clears throat> uh, at the end, we will take some questions um and uh, be glad to tr try to make sure that folks walk away with a full understanding of these reports we're going to be repeating this webinar several times it will also be recorded so we will make it available uh, afterwards for fo folks that were not able to be on the call today looks like we have a pretty healthy group on this call okay we'll move on to the next slide This is just provides the statutory reference for uh, the readiness rates from the portion of the statute, section 1002.67, that uh, provides and describes how the Office of Early Learning will calculate the readiness rates. And I also wanted to make sure if somebody can type in that they can hear me. We have somebody saying whether or not that they can't hear. Are there folks that are able to hear? Yes, okay, I see lots of people saying they can hear, great. <clears throat> At the bottom of this slide is uh, the link to the, uh, on our website where all of the regulations may be found. And uh, this link, if you look at it, you just go to the Office of Early Learning's uh, homepage. If you go to BBK and follow the topics to regulations, it's very easy to find, but we keep all of the statutes and all of the rules that apply to BPK in the same area. And these are very good resources for um, providers to uh, focus on. So we're going to go to the next slide. So with the authority of that statute, we amended Rule 6M-8.601 this year. In August of 19, the State Board of Education took up modifications to the rule. The main uh, source of that of changes was to accommodate the early the gains made by children while they were attending VPK on the VPK assessment that is administered during the VPK program. So now this was adding an additional component to the readiness rates. So now we are looking and considering the kindergarten screening results from when children have left the VPK program and have gone on to kindergarten. And then we are including a portion from the VPK assessment that was administered during VPK in, in order to provide the information about learning gains into the readiness rate. So we'll be going through a couple of examples and showing you how that gets interjected into the rates and how that shows up on your reports. Um, again, and in this slide, we have provided directly from the rule language the formula that shows uh, how the readiness rates were going to be calculated this year. In simple terms, we're provi pro pro providing or we're determining the number of children that are ready for kindergarten and turning that into a percentage. So what is the percentage of children that are ready on kindergarten? We are adding points from the learning gains and uh, we'll go walk through some examples of that to come up with a total readiness rate score for each provider. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so this is our first example, and I'm hoping everybody can see these numbers. Uh, they're, the screen's a little big. We're going to zoom in on it, but if we, if you click, if you want to click through. Okay, so the first area up here um, is going to identify the program year. It will also identify whether it's a school year or summer program. Remember that we give separate rates for the school year and the summer program. Okay, in the next block we're going to look at, I can click on it. So up at the top right now, you see a big uh, block there that's blacked out, but this will be where the provider's name and address appears to identify what provider this report is for. Okay. Just below that, it will list the score that has been attributed to that provider. So it'll have 
for the, for the year, the provider kindergarten readiness rate, and it'll show the score in where that blue arrow just pointed to. Okay. <clears throat> Over on the top right-hand corner, under readiness rate history, this is where a provider will show if they are a provider on probation or not. So we haven't filled in for this year yet because we're still at the preliminary stage, but when the final reports come out, we will be populating this area with a yes or no of whether or not the provider is on probation. So this is interactive to all of the history that is attached to the provider, and uh, we show that history going back uh, all the way to the inception of the VPK program. Okay. And then we have an area below here where we're going to look at the data uh, for this individual provider. And we're going to bring this up on a screen that's a little easier to see. So we'll go on to the next page. I think it should be the next page now. Oh, I'm sorry, we have one more piece. Uh, the arrow that just appeared on the screen, this is pointing to where we have the text information that describes all of the things above. So it's almost like a list of definitions or descriptions of each of the items below. Okay? Okay, so now what we've done is we've taken that little middle part out of the report we were just looking at so we can talk about the individual pieces that are showing up in the report. So the first piece up here provides the number on the far left side at the top is the number of children that were served. So these are the number of children that the provider was paid for during the VPK program year, whether it's school year or summer, it's going to be independent for those, but this is the number of kids that were served. The second uh, number in blue talks about the number of children meeting substantial completion. The third number is the number of children that were screened. So that's on the Florida Kindergarten Readiness Screener, which uses the STAR Early Literacy as its sole tool. And the next number is gonna be the number of children that are included in the readiness rate. So we'll stop there. Okay, so to come up with this number, um, what we have to do is we have to know about which children are going to be included in the readiness rate. And um, so we, first we need to know what children were met substantial completion that completed at least 70% of the program. And then we also need to look at the children that were screened on the kindergarten screening tool, the STAR Early Literacy. Between those two, each child who's going to be included in the readiness rate must have met substantial completion and must have been screened on the kindergarten screening and, and matched to that data. So that's why we get different numbers going across here because as you go across, the, not all children that were uh, completed the program were screened and not all children that were screened and likewise completed the program. <clears throat> In the far right side, we have identified the number of children that made learning gains so this is the number of children who were included in the readiness rate of which of those children made learning gains on the VPK assessment. And learning gains are determined by whether or not the child between AP1 and AP3 on the VPK assessment would have had moved from one scoring category to a higher scoring category or have started the year at the highest scoring category and maintained that high level in all four domains. So in each of the four domains on VPK assessment, we are evaluating whether the child made gains. And in order for them to appear in this number on the far right side, the child would have had to have one, been included in the, in the calculation and be a child who met learning gains in each of the four domains on the VPK assessment. Okay. So we start to break these numbers down here by listing the number of children that were in the calculation, the number of children that were ready, the percent of children that were ready for kindergarten, and in that uh, row, the lowest row going across the data there, you just have the points that were awarded based on learning gains. So if we go back to that formula and we know how many kids made learning gains, we're dividing that by the number of children that were included in the readiness rate, multiplying that times 0.1 and 
coming up with the number of points that are added to the readiness rate for that provider. So in the example that we have here, so we'll move to this sheet. Um, from, from the report before, 92 children served, 64 children in the readiness rate, 38 of the children scored ready, 26 uh, children had learning gains. So we end up with uh, the 38 children that were scored ready divided by 64, so that's 59%. To find the learning gains, we had 41% of the kids made learning gains times 0.1 is 4. So we're going to add the percent, total percent ready, and the, and the points from the learning gains together. So in this case, this provider had kindergarten screening results where 59% of the kids were ready. We added four points for learning gains, and their total readiness rate for this provider is a 63. Okay, so you noticed in the numbers that we were looking at before, they were highlighted in blue on the report. For any provider, if they click on those numbers that run across the report, the numbers that are in blue, for instance, children served by the provider, they will get a, the system will return to them a screen that looks similar to this, and they're able to tell for each individual child in their program, information that helped calculate the readiness rates. So for each child, and obviously we've blackened out the names of these children, so we are securing their information, uh, you can see the number of hours that the child attended. You can see the percent of hours that uh, that, that number came up to. So if a child attended 540 hours of the school year program, you would see 100% in here. And you can see on our top row in this example, only 57 hours were attended, so that was a little more than 10% of the total hours. As you move across, uh, you can see where the, the, the three columns that have yeses and noes in them. The first one is med substantial completion. So for each child, you're able to run your finger down your a list of children and look at them and determine, what, did this child meet substantial completion, yes or no? Did this child, uh, were they matched to a star early literacy? That's the star early literacy participant column, yes or no. If you see a yes in both of those columns, like a second, the child in the second row in this example, that child is included in the readiness rate calculation. Following that, you have the learning gains, yes or no. So this tells you for the children who were included in the readiness rate, whether or not, uh, well, actually it tells you for all children, whether or not the child made learning gains on the VPK assessment according to the definition of learning gains that's in the rule. Okay. So, so those are the, and we just arrowed to the three columns we're talking about. So when you're looking at your own individual data, these are the three columns you want to focus on and they tell you pretty much everything you need to know at the child level to determine who, so you know individually which children were included in your readiness rate and whether or not we attributed gains to those students. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the second example. And we're not going to drop in all the arrows on this example, but it gives you just a different set of numbers. It's a, a provider that served a little bit fewer children. And uh, you can see the same numbers going across. Children served, children meeting substantial completion, the children who were screened. Then looking back to that data of which children met both met substantial completion as well as uh, were screened, and the total, then you get that total number of children that were included in the readiness rate calculation. It's taking that number, dividing it by the number of children, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, dividing the number of children that were ready for kindergarten by that number of children that were included in the calculation and coming up with the first number, which in this example is We're going to pause for just one second. Okay. 
we had to do a little focusing here so we could read the numbers uh, that are on our screen, but we had uh, 10 children uh, out of 17 that were ready on the kindergarten readiness screener, which uh, resulted in a, a percent ready of uh, kids in kindergarten of 59. Then we show the number of children that made learning gains and calculate the points that were awarded from learning gains. In this case, that was three. So we had a final readiness rate of 59 plus three or 62. So that would have been there. This, this uh, total readiness rate for this provider would have been a 62. And that's what's on the screen right now. Okay. This is the same data here, but uh, just focusing on that middle column. Again, 10 into 17, 59, add the learning gains, total score of 62. Okay. We'll move on to the next screen. And this takes that same data and breaks it out uh, with a little bit bigger numbers that we can all read. So we're going to pause on this screen just to let people kind of review that. And I'll tell you what, why don't we go back one screen? So now that you've seen these, and I want to make sure people are able to read them, that it's nice and big. Now if we go back one screen, um, you can see where these numbers that we just showed are placed on the screen. Uh, picking up those numbers from the various pieces on the report and being able to put them into the calculation. Okay, let's go forward again. Okay. And like we provided in the first example, this is another, uh, by clicking on any of those blue numbers, uh, the children number of children served, in this case I think it was 22, you can easily go over and see which children met both substantial completion as well as were a star early literacy participant. Those are the kids in the readiness rate. And then you can see the children's learning, children who are identified as having made learning gains on the far right side of the screen. Okay. This is our third example. So again, it's just another report, and the reason we wanted to show this one is because in the middle of this report, this is a smaller provider, so providers have to have at least four children who both met substantial completion and were screened on the STAR early literacy, and we were able to match those results before they even get a rate at all. If they don't have that requirement, we don't issue a rate, we print some verbiage that says the, the provider did not have enough children that either met substantial completion or not enough children that were screened in order to produce a readiness rate, and they simply don't get one. But in this case, we are still dealing with a smaller numbered provider, and what you see here is when you get down to the number of children that were ready for kindergarten on the report, that number, it really is there, but what you see in the middle of the screen below the uh, numbers in blue is a little asterisk where it says the children that were uh, ready for kindergarten, that number is an asterisk out simply because it's less than 10. You'll see a little place down below where, where there's an asterisk that says no data are reported when it's less than 10 children. <clears throat> that doesn't mean there isn't a number working behind there, and you can see in this case this provider still had a calculation that we were able to do. It's just we're not able to show that data, the performance data for the children when there's less than 10 children. So if we go to the next slide, well, that uh, is highlighted and made a little bit bigger, easier to see. You can see where that asterisk is sitting there under the column children ready for kindergarten, but you can still see the uh, that the calculation follows through. It follows the same pattern as the examples we've already provided. And we'll go to the next screen where these numbers, you will get to see the how the numbers are applied. And in the third bullet on this uh, slide, you see the asterisk in that bullet. Where the asterisk number of children scored ready ended up being 57%. The learning gains uh, were calculated to be uh, 43%. So we ended up with a 57 uh, as the readiness uh, score for kindergarten screening, and the total readiness rate after we added learning gains is 61. 57 plus the four from learning gains equals the 61. Okay, so that's the, I think we have one more piece on there. We have, a, yes, we have, a, like we did before, again, this is just 
you, when you're looking at your report, this is just the data you can drill down and uh, being very redundant, uh, you can look over for each row of each child and see what the data for each um, uh, child revealed was. What, whether they met substantial completion, whether or not they're a star early learning, literacy participant, and whether or not that child made learning gains. <clears throat> so we're gonna pause here and go to the questions. We probably won't be able to answer every single question, but let's, we're gonna go through and pause for a minute and read your questions and see if there's some things that we can help clear up the air so that folks have a good understanding of this. So we're gonna pause the phone for a second and give us a chance to view, review the questions that you all have typed in. So please hold for a second. Okay, <clears throat> we're just going to start going through these, and I think uh, we've probably already answered a few of these a little bit, but we want to make sure people are clear. The question is, for a gain to be counted, does it need to be a gain in all four domains? At the ch whole child level, yes, the child will need to have made gains in each of the four domains. <clears throat> and uh, again, what that means is they went from a lower scoring category to a higher scoring category, or they maintained that high scoring category. So if you came in to the school year or the child came in at exceeding expectations on the VPK assessment and they remained in AP3 at exceeding expectations, we would still count that child as having made gains. <clears throat> um, we had a question, what about smaller centers that serve only seven or 11 children? I think we just covered that, but basically if you get down to your data, you, sh you will see where you have to have four children that met substantial completion and were screened and participant in the STAR Early Literacy, the kindergarten screening, before we will issue a rate. Now, if you uh, serve 10 children and none of your children were screened, that's, that, we would default to that second category. Not enough children were screened in order to uh, calculate a readiness rate. Uh, likewise, if you serve 10 children, but only three of them ever met 70% of the program, like maybe something happened and children left that center, uh, it would be the same situation. We would not calculate, later, calculate a rate unless we had uh, four children who met substantial completion and were screened on the STAR Early Literacy. Okay, uh, there's a question, is the STAR Early Literacy test taken in kindergarten? Yes, it is. That is the Florida Kindergarten Screener. STAR Early Literacy is the instrument that the Department of Education uses for the Florida Kindergarten Readiness Screener. That one. Okay. We had um, a question. Uh, oh, how's it? Uh, so, um, our summer VPK consists mostly of IEP children with substantial learning challenges. How does this affect us? <clears throat> the, the, there's two things that come into play here. Um, the, when the children go to kindergarten, if the child has an IEP, and the local school district determines that the STAR Early Literacy is not an appropriate assessment for that child, and they, are, they do not participate in the STAR Early Literacy, then that would uh, mean that that child doesn't ever get matched to a score and they are not part of your rate. However, the, uh, that doesn't mean that all children just by having a disability are uh, given another assessment or not uh, considered for the STAR Early Literacy. And those that are, if we have a, scar a score for them, are included in the readiness rate calculation. They do become a factor if a provider is faced with having to apply for good cause exemption. That would be one of the reasons, one of the items that we would look at for uh, unique and extraordinary circumstances that would a provider would be explaining potentially, well, I uh, served this uh, category of children that uh, have special needs, and uh, that's part of my good cause exemption application. But just simply because the child uh, has a learning disability does not mean that they are excluded. 
Okay. Question about how do I get to the child data? So when you are logged into your uh, secure home page and you click on any of those blue numbers that we showed in the all the examples where it says the number of children that were uh, served in VPK or the number of children that uh, met substantial completion, you can click on any of those numbers, but you must be logged into the system to see that data. Okay, I think we've covered that. We've gone over learning gains. Uh, the question about when we will hear back about the dispute that we submitted. Our office is going through those. There were several hundreds of disputes submitted. Each of them, if you go back to your uh, where you submitted it and click on the form, when our office is finished reviewing it, we will type comments in there and you will be able to see what our specific comments were back to any dispute that you uh, put into the system. There's a question about who came up with this form of calculation. It was, uh, this was through the rulemaking process that happened last summer. And this was uh, widely vetted through uh, various uh, workshops as well as public hearings and was presented to the State Board of Education. Okay. And a question, why charter schools don't test? Charter schools are public schools and they are required by law to test. If you have a charter school that's in your local a school district that you believe did not uh, screen their children, you may want to touch base with that local school district and try to figure out what happened there. Okay, we're just pausing to look at the questions again. Says, so is there a percentage number of children that are tested per provider? Um, you, somebody can figure out the percentage, but just overall, that is not uh, part of the readiness rates because we are only concerned of the percentage of children that were screened who also met substantial completion. But you are able to tell from your data who was screened and who is not. Okay, on the current screen, the bottom two children do not take, did not make the 70%, but it shows they were tested. Why is that? Because the 70% is of the hours that were attended at that VPK provider. Whether or not they were screened or not is what happens when they went on to kindergarten. So it is very possible for children to have not completed uh, someone's program. For ex a good example would be they start the school year there in August, in uh, October, their parents decide to move them to another center. They're still going to have August to October at that center, but they will not have met substantial completion. That doesn't mean they didn't go to kindergarten and get screened, and we will still show, no, you didn't meet substantial completion. Yes, you did get screened. And that's, again, since both columns are not yes, the child's not included in the calculation. They still show there. Okay, we had a question. There was a question, is this how they're going to calculate next year as well? As of right now, the rule that's in place, the, the answer to that would be yes. The rule that uh, was passed by the State Board of Education will uh, it w be in effect for next year's calculation as well. Are providers who scored under 60 definitely going to be considered a provider in probation? Yes, they will. So when the final rates are issued, which right now these we only have preliminary rates out there, if the final rate is below 60, that provider will be placed on probation. Okay, there's a question, how do you calculate learning gains for children who may not have been enrolled in the first assessment? And was uh, when the when the first assessment was given and were not required to assess the second period. <clears throat> the 
The only children for learning gains that would be counted are those who have AP1 score and AP2 score. So if a child does not have both of those, we would not consider whether or not they have learning gains. Okay, there's a question about why faith-based doesn't get tested. Um, faith-based, if it was a private faith-based school offering kindergarten, the, whether or not they want to test is a decision that that school gets to make. Public schools are required to administer the Florida Kindergarten Readiness Screener. The private schools that uh, have registered as a private school in the state, they get to decide whether or not they are going to participate in the kindergarten screening and administer it at their school. There's a question about children do not have to pass STAR to be considered for learning gains. So I'll kind of go back to the beginning here. There are two pieces at play here. STAR early literacy is from the kindergarten screening once the children have left VPK and gone on to a kindergarten and are screened. The learning gains are from the VPK assessment that was administered by the VPK provider during the VPK program year. Okay. Question asked, are the final rates posted? No, the final rates have not posted. We are doing these webinars in preparation for when the final rates come out, that folks will be able to better understand the reports that are issued. Okay. Are e ESAW and ELL students included in the rates? They... Um, there are uh, there are children who are ESOL students who are included in the calculation. Again, it is for kindergarten screening, it is similar to uh, students with disabilities that uh, the local school may decide that it is not appropriate to give the child uh, the STAR early literacy. If that happens, then they would not be counted because we would never have a score for them. Um, I, without, uh, I would defer you to the Office of uh, State Assessment in terms of any accommodations that are given for students of uh, English as a second language. Um, there's a question of why is it given on a computer? The kindergarten screening tool uh, known as STAR Early Literacy is uh, only available on the computer. It is an adaptive test and that is the only mode that it's delivered in. It can be done on different platforms such as a tablet or uh, um, other device that is able to do it. So it's not just always a standalone computer. Okay, we're just pausing again, looking at the questions. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions in here, and some of it is things we've already addressed, but there is one, how do we apply for a good cause exemption? The only providers that have to apply for good cause exemption are providers that have a uh, probationary status that is at least at three years. So, for instance, if we had somebody who was already on probation and they were in probation year two status, when we release the readiness rates this year, if that provider remains on probation, they will have to apply for good cause exemption. So you do not know whether or not you have to apply for good cause exemption until the final readiness rates are released.
Okay, so we have a question of when children are absent, how many days, and how does that affect the rate? Um, so the, uh, num the number that we are looking at when we uh, determine whether or not a child met substantial completion is the actual number of days that were attended. So you may have a child that was absent many days, but we look at the number of days that the child was recorded as being in a seat in that provider. Okay, there's a question, why don't BPK providers and kindergartners or kindergarten use the same method of test and screening? Um, that's a good question, but they are two completely different procurements. Uh, one, they're not, one of them is a procurement. The BPK assessment tool is actually owned by the state of Florida. So we have that available to us at no cost and it was developed for Florida in Florida for us. The kindergarten screening tool was assessed through an RFP process through the Department of Education. Okay, we're just pausing and looking through the questions again. Okay, lots of questions we're going through here, but we're trying to get to some of them that we think will help everyone. It says, if a child completed the required hours of your program but only tested in two testing periods, why are they not eligible for learning gains? So the VP in, for the VPK assessment, only AP1 and AP3 at the statewide level are required for all providers to participate in. So those are the two periods we're looking at. For, provider, for general providers, not providers on probation, um, the AP2, the middle assessment period, is an optional piece, so it is not considered for learning gains. Okay, uh, there was a question asked, is there a way we can see the children's star score? This could help us know how we are falling short since we don't know the children's abilities. Okay, so there's uh, two, two parts to this. Um, this. Once the child has left your VPK program and has gone on to uh, kindergarten and they're no longer enrolled in your school anymore, then uh, that, sh that data is not returned back to the providers. If the parents chose to share that with you, that would be their right to do so. But once the children have left and gone on, they're not enrolled in your program and you would not be able to see their data. We do not include that in any of our calculations that we show to providers at the individual child level. However, we do in somewhat, some, a little bit of time after the readiness rates are, are released, the final readiness rates, we will publish your classroom data just like we have for the last two years so that you can drill down to the classroom and see the STAR early literacy, early literacy information at the domain level for each of your classrooms. <clears throat> there is a caveat there that the class, just like in the data that we were talking about earlier, has to have at least 10 children in it before we will show the data. 
and we understand that for VPK providers, oftentimes the classrooms are small, and uh, oftentimes we have to not show that data for the guidelines for showing student data. But we wanted uh, as many providers to be able to see that as possible. Again, that does not get put up on the readiness rate site until after the release of the final readiness rates, and we have concluded all changes to the data. Yeah, there was just a question of is this is this the same web webinar they're offering on Friday on nine on 124 yes it is it says if you are on probation does it affect the rate you are paid no it does not there's a question will a provider without a rate be on probation that is possible because if the provider was already on probation, they would remain a provider on probation even if we don't issue a rate to, for them. Um, the, the converse of that is the only way to be removed from probationary status is to earn a rate that is satisfactory. Okay, and we're trying to look and see if there's any other questions related to our topic here. We're kind of starting to see things get off here. Okay, we have a question. If both were yes, why did learning gains get a no? So uh, again, the first two columns for substantial completion in STAR Early Literacy are completely separate from the learning gains coming in from the VPK assessment. Okay, so there's a question, does it mean the current score that shows does not really mean it is the precise one? So the, I'm, I'm gonna take that to be that you're looking at the preliminary readiness rates, there are, are a lot of changes that occur um, between preliminary and final. So the rate you're looking at is preliminary. When it is a final rate, it will be published and named so that it is uh, named as a, a final readiness rate. Okay, there's a question. Will the last two years rates count towards three consecutive years if the provider still scores low this year? So um, the answer to that question is no for the 16, 17, and 17, 18 years, we did release the readiness rates, but those readiness rates did not add to uh, somebody's current count of how many years they were on probation or did not put a provider on probation itself. The only net effect of those two years was to be able to remove a provider from probationary status. So if somebody is uh, uh, was a one-year provider on probation from before, and they've been low the last two years, and they get a low performing rate, those last two years aren't going to count towards the count of how many years probation. That would be one from before, no 16, 17, no 17, 18, 18, 19 would put them at a provider on probation year two. Okay, to, just to be clear, so I may have misspoke, the learning gains that are we, we use to calculate are from AP1 and AP3. So AP2 is not considered uh, when we are considering learning gains for the child from the VPK program. Okay, we're gonna pause for just a second and see how many more we can address.
Okay, so um, there are a lot, a lot of questions in this inbox, and we still have a little bit of ground to cover. So we've kind of looked through these. I think many of these we've already answered the questions. Again, we're going to post this uh, webinar, and it'll be available once we've uh, recorded it and got a good, clean version. Um, we probably, although I was not told, we probably will post the, pre the presentation along with it itself. That is what we have done before. So um, at any rate, so we've got a couple more slides to go through, and we need to give you all some information. So we're going to move on to the next slide. Okay, so just kind of an update on where we are is uh, right now we have an 85% child match rate, which is really very good. Um, this year so far, 2,256 provider verifications were submitted. That sounds like a lot, but actually it's only 34%. So roughly a third of all providers were able to do verification submissions. There are 302 provider disputes that have been uh, posted to the website. So here's the news that we need to uh, let you all know. Because the, these rates for the first time in five years are going to have impact on providers, and only 34% of the providers were able to do verification. We know from many phone calls we received of providers that missed the deadline, had uh, difficulty getting in, whatever the reasons were. We know that we, only a third of our providers were able to do verification. So the verification and dispute process will reopen for providers. If they've already submitted a, a dispute, there's no need to do anything else. If they've already done verification, there's no need for anybody to do anything else. We do not have an exact timeline on when the website is going to open. So for those people on this call, I would only suggest that we will communicate broadly like we did before of here's the date it will open, here's the date it will close, um, obviously, if we're going to open it up again, we have to have time for our coalitions to uh, address any changes that are made as well. So the important news we want to give everybody on the line is that we are going to open the process back up and give their, uh, some additional opportunity for providers to get in there and look at this data. Um, it is very similar to what we've been going over today <clears throat> in terms of understanding which numbers mean which things, and uh, we hope that this will increase the number of providers that have uh, are able to complete their verification and uh, make sure that their rate is accurate as possible. As it has always been, our process is, uh, you know, to have the most accurate data possible. So again, we have not uh, put, uh, we do not have the exact date it's going to open yet. O OEL will be notifying providers and ELCs as to what the upcoming schedule for reopening uh, verification and dispute process is. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, um, we've given you all this slide before in previous presentations, but uh, just from literally one click on our website from the FloridaEarlyLearning.com website, you can uh, find information if you click on VPK about providers that I've circled in red. Also, the uh, on the right side of the screen, circled is the Florida standards for four-year-olds. Every VPK provider should be familiar with this, but if you're not, this is a great resource and a great place for folks to go and make sure they understand the standards. The third little item circled is also the regulation that will take you to the link that we provided earlier on in the presentation, and that links you to all of the statutes and all of the rules that apply to VPK. So if you're a VPK provider, those are really important things to be aware of. Okay, so I don't think we're going to have much time for questions, but we are going to go back to the question box and just see, again, you will be receiving information about the reopening. We can't answer schedule and stuff uh, about when exactly that's going to happen. <clears throat> and uh, let's see if there's anything over here that we can uh, help address in the couple minutes we've got left. Okay, we're going to pause for a second while we look at the question box. Okay, there's a question. What about prior low scores before 2016? Are they being counted with these 2019 scores? Yes. So the, the readiness rates that were in effect in 2012-13, if a provider was on probation at that time, those results are being included in there if they have never been able to exit probation status. Okay. 
Okay, so if there are questions uh, about uh, individual students, like I see one up here, what if uh, I have a child that completed AP1 and AP3, but there's no gains being shown? If you looked at your data and you see that there is a child that you believe we have incorrectly uh, accounted for, that is the reason that somebody would have submitted a, a dispute. And as we just said a minute ago, we're going to be reopening that process. So again, you would have to look at the definition. Does the child meet the definition of learning gains in all four domains independently? And then we, you would want to put that into a dispute. Where are, the ready to, where are the rates published? Are parents able to see them? Again, right now we only have preliminary readiness rates. The public cannot see the preliminary readiness rates. However, when they are published as final readiness rates, the general public are able to see them. Okay, can we go back one screen on the presentation? So there's a question about um, where will the webinar be posted? So on the, what we have on the screen now, under the topic of providers, where it says assessments and flickers, that is the area that we posted the previous webinar about the calculation of readiness rates. Those postings are already up there. Um, I, I'm going to assume that we will put them in the same place so somebody looking for this information would find them all together. But if you click on that assessments and flickers under the providers topic, that's where you'll find the previous ones and when we post this one. I don't know which version we'll post this one. We have several that we're giving throughout the week and we'll probably take the one that is the uh, cleanest and has the less start, starts and stops in it to get posted for people to go listen to. Most likely what we will do is uh, also post the presentation itself that if you didn't want to listen to the whole hour that we've been talking now, that you would have an opportunity just to review the slides themselves. Okay, so there is a question, um, it says, in the years that scores were not counted, so for 16, 17, and 17, 18, those scores, while I say they did not count, I also said that they only had one effect, was to remove a provider from probation. So that they, they have the ability that if you scored well above 60, either in 16, 17, or in 17, 18, I'm sorry, if you scored 60 and above, you would have been removed from probationary status so that those rates did do not count towards probation in terms of which year of probation somebody's on, but they were able to take someone off of probation. So to the person that was asking if you had a successful rate in those years, you should see that you are no longer a provider on probation. Okay, we're going to pause one more time. Okay, there's a question about what about the years prior, 2015, 16, oh, I'll read these, 13, 14, 14, 15, and 15, 16. Those are the three years where no readiness rate calculations were made. So those years have no effect on any provider because we did not calculate or publish a readiness rate for any provider in the state in those years. Okay, we are going to close up the call here.
Uh, we want to thank all these folks. There's hundreds of people on the line right now and uh, hundreds of people in front of keyboards, apparently. So um, we're going to close out the call. What we do want to let you know is that the information about when the uh, verification and dispute process will be reopened will be sent via email like we sent previous announcements. So we'll be sending that out. So keep an eye on your inboxes of uh, communication coming from the Office of Early Learning. And uh, remember that those messages sometimes go to junk folders. So kind of keep an eye on your junk folder. We'll also be asking our Early Learning Coalitions to help us get that word out to folks. So hopefully they will be able to double that communication through their communication channels with providers um, as, we, uh, as we get that out. But right now, uh, we do not have the specific dates. So we wouldn't encourage you to be contacting our office or whatnot asking for specific dates, because right now we would have to tell you that we don't have them. Um, uh, again, uh, there is a, somebody asking about the copy of the presentation. The presentation and a recording, not necessarily this recording, will be posted underneath the provider topic on the Office of Early Learning's homepage. So, um, a lot of words today, a lot of questions coming in. We appreciate your participation and you taking time out of your day to participate in this call. I hope it's been helpful to the folks on the line, and we'll look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you for what you do for Florida's kids.